Hello and welcome to this History Revision podcast on what happened in Russia in 1917. First of all, the dual authority. Crowds had demanded that the Duma take power after the abdication of the Tsar. Some Duma members were worried about the army generals and loyal to the Tsar and arriving to execute them for treatment. Some even fled the city. The Provisional Government was formed on March 2nd after negotiations between the Soviet and the Provisional Commission of the Duma, which had 12 members and was set up by Mikhail, set up by Mikhail Rodzianko on the 27th of February during the revolution. It's only intended to rule until a constituent assembly could be elected, which would then draw up a new constitution for Russia. The first Prime Minister was to be Prince Lvov, a wealthy noble landowner and former cadets leader who had been the leader, uh, the chairman of Zemgor. Essentially, he was a traditionalist, but favoured decentralised government. The rest of the government was mainly made up of liberals, Octoberists and cadets. The only socialist was Alexander Kerensky, who also sat on the Soviet. The Soviet was set up on the 27th of February and had over 3,000 members and deputies, and was not dominated by any particular, particular party, although the Mensheviks probably had the most. The provisional government needed the support of the Soviet, as that was in control of the factories, the services and, crucially, the army without which, without any of them, the provisional government and Russia couldn't work. The Soviet did not press for redistribution of land or state control of industry, but did get amnesty for those charged with religious, terrorist or military crimes, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom to form unions, freedom to strike, freedom to hold meetings, basic civil liberties. Soldiers were to enjoy the same civil liberties as civilians. There was to be self-government for the army, the establishment of a citizen militia to keep order, and a the garrison of St. Petersburg was not to be sent to the front, and it was allowed to keep its weapons, and various other demands as well. So the provisional government ruled, whilst the Soviet watched over them. The Soviet had control of the army, so it had de facto power, while the provisional government had the legal de jure power. The working class Soviet was willing to support the middle class government because it had experience in maintaining the economy. The Soviet leaders feared anarchy and could not be sure that they could control the people. They also feared a right-wing counter-revolution if things were going too quickly. Their Marxist views had also stated that a middle-class bourgeois revolution should precede a working-class proletariat one. Even the Bolsheviks who were in the country, Stalin and Kamenev, gave the government their support as it was still struggling against the remnants of the old regime, although they did want to pressure the provisional government to stop the war. They also began to think about linking with the Mensheviks. Lenin disagreed strongly, but he was still out of the country, so he was overruled. The Soviet agreed to the continuation of the war. No one wanted to lose to the Germans, and they knew that they would lose land if they surrendered. Early developments. The peasants celebrated, thinking that they would get the land. Soldiers deserted and came back home so they would not lose out with land. The government tried to strengthen its hold on Russia by appointing provincial governors with commissars, mainly Zemstvo chairman, but committees of public organisation made from Zemstvo's had more authority than the um, provincial governors in many places. Soviets were set up in towns and then in villages. The government struggled to control more distant parts of the empire, but only Poland got a declaration of independence, and that was because it was uh, behind German lines at the time, most of it. The provisional government only ever really controlled Petrograd, Moscow and the central western provinces problems or weaknesses with the provisional government. It soon had to cope with disappointments, as its line that most major decisions had to wait till an elected assembly was voted in didn't please those who wanted immediate change. The removal of censorship and the freedom of speech allowed them also to voice their complaints quite vociferously. In April, the provisional government set up land committees to deal with the land question by collecting information on land holding. They didn't want full-scale desertion from the army, desperate to get land. This weight frustrated the peasants and they were also disappointed by the new grain requisitioning scheme, requisitioning scheme, which despite them giving more money still provided less than they needed. There were peasant disturbances uh, where they seized property often, and these um, seizures were often organised by the revived Mir. The provisional government had to use armed forces in places. The provisional government was desperate to get the factories working again and supported employees efforts to restore discipline employer's efforts to restore the discipline rather. Even though conciliation chambers were set up to negotiate between worker and employers, they and the factory committees were set up uh, to look after the interests of the workers. They didn't really improve living standards or working conditions and food shortages continued, making the matters even worse. Factories were also closing down and the strikes crippled the ones still open, leaving both the workers and the factory owners disillusioned with the provisional government. 
The war continued and men continued to be conscripted. The army continued to fail. There were some improvements and reduction in aristocratic control of the army, although there weren't many trained officers to replace them. Um, soldiers' committees were set up under the order number one, and um, it often ignored the government and even the Soviet. Desertions continued. There were 365,000 from March to May in 1917. There's also widespread, uh, widespread hostility to the provisional government's decision to continue the war. Although the provisional government needed to continue the war to receive financial aid from their allies, Britain and France, and they did want to win because Russia had been promised access to the Mediterranean uh, ports in secret treaties uh, by the other allies if they helped the allies be victorious. The Soviet, however, wanted an end to the war, calling for peace without annexation or indemnities, which the government accepted, but then undermined when one of them, Milyukov, pledged to the allies that they would continue until the Germans were defeated. Milyukov was forced to resign by early May and replaced by Kerensky. Lenin returned on April 3rd, 1917, and he was helped back into Russia by the Germans in the sealed train. They hoped he would end the war. His speech at Finland Station was written down and published in the Bolshevik newspaper Pravda as the April Theses, although some of them were added retrospectively in May after Trotsky's return. The basic message of the April Theses was that the revolution was passing from the bourgeoisie middle class stage to the working class proletariat stage and that no support should be given to the provisional government as it told lies and that the Soviets were the only way forward. All cooperation with other parties should stop and the ultimate aim of the revolution was not freedom but power to the workers. Power should be transferred to the Soviets, the war should be brought to an end, and all land should be taken over by the state and relocated to peasants by local Soviets. These demands have been summed up as slogans, peace, bread and land, as well as the other slogan, all power to the Soviets. However, there were still only 26,000 Bolsheviks, a minority even amongst the socialists, and even those were divided over the April theses, some thought Lenin was out of touch and was in the pay of the Germans, which he was, but there you go. The Mensheviks thought that his radical proposals would undermine their progress and stimulate a counter-right-wing reaction. Lenin gradually won them over with his skillful speech-making, and the fact that a lot of what Lenin was proposing was already happening. Peasants, for example, were seizing the land already, and Lenin could then take the credit. Despite the Bolsheviks being unconcerned with land normally, as they believed the revolution was a workers' affair, Lenin changed tack and said the revolution had provided unique circumstances where the peasants had become a true revolutionary force. Lenin stole the SR's lands, land to the peasants slogan. Peasants started supporting the Bolsheviks, and the SR's split and many joined the Bolsheviks and became the less left SR's. By the end of April, the Bolsheviks had agreed to lead the opposition to the provisional government. The new offensive in June. The provisional government became more socialist in May with the end of Milyukov and new Menshevik and SR appointments, including Kerensky to the war minister um, position, which alienated property owners and army leaders uh, to the right but socialists were still hamstrung in a majority liberal government and isolated from the Soviet. The first all-Russian Congress of Soviets met on the 3rd of June. It voted overwhelmingly in favour of the provisional government. Only the Bolsheviks voted against it. The government then launched a new offensive in June in an attempt to rally support. Kerensky masterminded a massive recruitment drive, but failed to persuade existing soldiers to stop deserting. Though. The offensive failed, causing massive desertion and a loss of land through German counterattack. Peasant disturbances rose again. Certain revolutionaries in Petrograd thought the time had come to remove the provisional government. This led to the July days. The Ju July days were um, caused by shortage of fuel and raw materials, and 586 factories had to close between February and July, um, with 100,000 jobs lost because of that. Food prices had doubled, and the government was scared to act. The June offensive had failed miserably, like we just heard. Soviets were spreading, the peasants were seizing land. Were seizing land. The sailors at Kronstadt and the naval base there set up their own government. The government seemed to be not in control of Russia. In July, it all boiled over onto the Petrograd streets with workers, soldiers and sailors from the Kronstadt naval boat chanting all power to the Soviets and attacking property, looting shops, seizing buildings and going to the Tauride Palace to ask the Soviets to take power. It failed as it was disorganised and demonstrators fell out with each other. Soldiers loyal to the government dispersed them. So it shows you that they, the government still had soldiers loyal to them. The provisional government blamed the Bolsheviks and arrested some, including Trotsky, and sent them to jail. The Bolsheviks may have started it all, but it certainly wasn't the leaders who did that, and uh, it certainly was a miscalculation. Lenin was on holiday when it happened, and then fled to Finland without his beard, beard he shaved it off, um, to hide. He refused to condemn the July days, but later claimed that they had risen too soon, and without his say-so. Trotsky blamed the Mensheviks and the Social Revolutionaries. It didn't do the Bolsheviks much good. Troops loyal to the Soviet dispersed the crowd and the Soviet announced the Bolsheviks, burning their propaganda and closing Pravda. Lenin's reputation uh, fell for fleeing um, and the Bolsheviks' time looked as though it was over. 
it proved the opposition to the provisional government was disunited. The Bolsheviks were far from dominant um, as a revolutionary party, and the provisional government could still put down an armed insurrection with support from local troops and the Soviet. Prince Lvov was replaced by Kerensky, who was a socialist, and he was on the Soviet. And although the government had gone to the left like he was, he still wanted to include the liberal cadets in order to have a stable government. Then comes the Kornilov affair. Kornilov was made commander-in-chief of the army on July 16th by Kerensky. He was a disciplinarian and wanted the reintroduction of the death penalty for the army and to destroy the Soviet and the socialists. This went again against Order No. 1 and was opposed by the Soviet. Regiments involved in the July days were disbanded and Kronstadt was reduced to 100,000 men. Kornilov asked for banning strikes and um, sending workers to the front if they caused trouble. He wanted the railways put into control of the army. He wanted loyal troops to be brought into the capital to enforce the above measures. He claimed Kerensky had given the go-ahead for this. Kerensky subsequently denied it. The provisional government were in a dilemma. Kornilov's measures would have helped, but he might not stop there. Kornilov moved his cavalry troops towards Petrograd in trains and announced he was going to save the provisional government from being overthrown by the socialist-inspired revolutionaries. When Kornilov demanded martial law in Petrograd, Kerensky sent the Tsar far away and asked the Soviets to protect the provisional government from counter-revolution. The soldiers, sailors and workers then went to the streets again to defend the government, and the Bolsheviks organised armed bands of workers as a militia led by their Red Guards, and were given weapons by Kerensky, who um, they wanted to overthrow, ironically, uh, and crucially they kept them afterwards. Kerensky asked Kornilov to resign, saying that he was going to set up a military dictatorship. Um, that Kornilov was. Kornilov said the British government would pay the Germans. They moved towards Petrograd further the troops. Uh, they were only stopped by railway workers and persuaded to desert. Kornilov and his generals were arrested on September the 1st. The affair damaged Kerensky and his government. The Mensheviks and socialist leaders lost respect because of their association with Kerensky. The people would defend their city but not the provisional government who had shown how vulnerable they were to armed insurrection. Officers blamed him for betraying Kornilov and soldiers blamed him for appointing Kornilov in the first place. Did Kerensky want to destroy the Soviet and only stop Kornilov when he realised Kornilov was going to overthrow the provisional government as well? Was Kornilov really going to establish a military dictatorship, or did Kerensky make this up? Who knows, but the affair bolstered the Bolsheviks again, as they stood up to Kornilov. Lenin asked the Bolsheviks, from where he was in Finland, to set up committees to save the revolution throughout the country. Kerensky then released the Bolsheviks he'd arrested and imprisoned in July. Bolshevik membership rose to 200,000 people, and they were elected to Duma and in Soviets all over Russia. The Petrograd Soviet elections, they gained a majority of over 50%, and they also controlled the Moscow Soviet. Trotsky was elected chairman of the Petrograd Soviet. Yet they were not highly organised or disciplined. Lenin wanted them to stage a revolution in September, but Zinoviev and Kamenev said no, and they should wait until a constituent assembly was elected. Trotsky said they should wait for the Congress of Soviets in October. But Lenin... Eventually.